final panel today, we're going to talk about mobile cloud and big data for the enterprise. So I'd like to introduce to you Inan Lee. Inan Lee is currently an angel investor and advisor director for a number of high tech startups, both in Silicon Valley and in China. She's also the chief representative of Shanghai Yangon U.S. Innovation Center, responsible for the promotion and business development of Shanghai Yangon District and for doing business in Shanghai. She's the founder and former CEO of Excel Ops, and she's also one of the very few Asian women entrepreneurs in the high tech industry. She has over 20 years of leadership, management, and entrepreneur experience. Let's welcome Ann and Lee. So maybe we should uh, introduce all the uh, panelists to be on the uh, on the stage first. So you want to join? You want to join? Come up. Okay, please. Yeah. You want to come here? Uh, Piers, um, Piers Malik from IBM, and uh, Dr. Wei Li from NetBase, and Ken Wu from Google, <laughs> and Peggy Chen from uh, Benzinho. Right. So um, it's a Saturday afternoon at almost 4 p.m. <laughs> so I'm so glad to see still quite a few numbers of people staying for this panel. And I think for those who are staying, and uh, you will not be disappointed because we have a, a set of panelists who are, you know, from many different fields and, and also from a, a, a lot of company that you are very familiar with. So you're going to be able to. I learned a lot from the experience, and um, I hope to make this panel very lively and very fun. So first of all, I'd like to get each one of those uh, have um, an introduction of, them, of himself and also talk about their uh, related work area. So we'll start from uh, David and then go down and each one by one. Uh, David, please. Hi, <coughs> my name is David Chen. Um, currently, I'm still associate with uh, the company I founded uh, in 2001, Dr. Pantera. Previously, it's the result of the merger between the two companies called Van Simple and uh, iSoft. And then I continue to use the, uh, the title I used last year when I did it with a keynote speech. Uh, I consider this to be the chapter two uh, of the speech. So we come a long way, actually. Personally, um, I just relocated back from Beijing to back to Silicon Valley last year. I was in China for about 12 years to do my own startup. So it came a long way. The company, um, as I mentioned before, another predecessor of Hyzal was started in 1996, and we set up our office. In fact, we all companies started in Silicon Valley first. I see to raise money from a company in China. That's why we decided to move more people back to, to China. And then we raised uh, institutional investors' money uh, first with uh, DCM and Electric Capital, and then Sequoia Capital in 2005 and 2006, and the lot we went public in 2007. So today, we have 22,000 people around the globe. Uh, in the US, we have about 500 people. In Asia, we have 1,000 people. So we are pretty unique in terms of the company out of China. Uh, we, we have 50% of revenue still coming from North American European based customers like uh, 3M, uh, Google, uh, Motorola, etc. And then another 38% of revenue is from Greater China. In fact, we only built this business in the past five years, so it made a lot of contribution to our growth in the past. And then Asia Tech is another fast growing area for us. About, about 12% of revenue is coming from this area. And we even bought our very point Australia. So we've got a very diverse uh, business mix. And then I'm, I'm very glad that today we have a dedicated session for enterprise computing, because normally in the many high pro profile uh, meetings like this, uh, the enterprise computing typically overlooked or being sidelined by, but I think right now, enterprise as a person has been staying in the enterprise computing for so long, I think right now it's also coming back to the spotlight. This is the first area in human history that enterprise computing is lagging behind consumer computing, right? Because we, we have a problem about Sunday night, Monday morning problems. Sunday night, we're still playing with WeChat, Facebook, Twitter. But the moment we come to the workplace, 
for Monday, right? We are facing with a decade old system built by my former employer, like Oracle or other companies like SAP, etc. Right? So I think this is not going to last forever. I think it presents a huge opportunity for all the future entrepreneurs, all these new entrepreneurs. I think tons of my friends, when I moved back to China in 2001, lots of them moved back, start consumer internet companies, like Baidu or Airbnb, because many of them make very good fortunes, make a lot of impact to the society. And then that's the show for them, right? The BAT become the dominant uh, players. And then the last five years, the O2 are powered by mobile. They make another good major wave. So people also create uh, good wealth from there. But I think the next wave is all about how this and the, the, the internet phenomenon, including social, mobile, cloud, big data, how they enter into the real world and trick up the industries, especially industries like retail banking, travel transportation, government education, healthcare, etc. So how this industry could be take advantage of the new technology developed by the consumer internet companies. So I think this is the most challenging time and also the most exciting time. Uh, companies like Netflix, they're taking advantage of the new technology and they are doing very successfully. They compete against Hollywood studios, right? They have the very successful House of Cap, one of the first few TV series they made by themselves. And then company like IBM are probably going about itself. I mean, when I stepped down from media operation, the company was about two billion dollars. Today it's about four hundred million dollars. So we face a lot of industry pressures because we need to embrace the challenges. And if one of us if we change and and then we successfully transform ourselves, I think we're going to have a very bright future. So without the trans successful trans transformation, I think many companies, whether they are successful today or not, they're becoming to be classified as part of computer rust belt. So people are starting to talk about computer rust belt. I think one of the way to look at the, the latest technology, I, I think the Chinese philosophy is big. Even I use this one, the Tai Chi, can't even, uh, Tai Chi Helen Durban, that's my Weibo's name. So if you want to search my Weibo's name, that's my name actually, Tai Chi can't even. I think uh, the philosophy can be trained Heaven is corresponding to cloud computing, Earth is corresponding to mobile wearable computing, internet of things, and people is related to the social consumerization, I think. And we also talk a little bit about p 2 b to c right? So it's all coming together. And then Tai Chi is big data, because in the E uh, script, right, they talk about from zero to one, and one to everything, so that can be nice big data. Definitely we need to harness the intelligence from that. So for us, I mean, we are at the reflection point. So our mission, you can see the new logo of our company is packed with partnership for the era, for the new computing era. And then the, the two half threads means our company and our partner, com our uh, customers, like Bank of China, etc. They, they need to find a way to cope with the challenges, like new entrants, like Alibaba, etc. They're entering the banking sectors, right? So we help those traditional companies to cope with those challenges and together become victorious. Yeah. So this is the flat, right? And then I'd like to share with you more um, later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Wow. Thank you, David. So, so um, the next one is Peng. Peng is from uh, Google. Peng, do you want to do some introduction to Hi, everyone. Uh, it's my great pressure, um, pleasure to, uh, hear, uh, to be here to uh, share with some of my things. Um, experience on um, you know, handling big data in Google. And um, prior to Google, I uh, did a database research in BC Santa Barbara. And then I also spent some time in um, IBM research uh, working on the mix of structured and unstructured data and how to do keyword search on it. And prior to that, I was in uh, Microsoft research and working on you know, web mining, web data mining, and you know, building better you know, structured web um, data callers. Um, then after my PhD, um, I go to I joined Google and then part of the uh, Google uh, mobile monetization team. Um, so I, you know, basically witnessed you know the phenomenal growth in the you know mobile app um, explosion, you know the usage, and you know um, you know as you know you know uh, today um, the entire global advertising market is 550 billion dollars. 
and only a very relatively small portion of it is spending on digital advertising. And we believe that as more and more time, human time will you know, go into digital media consumption and advertising dollar will follow and eventually more and more advertising dollar will come to um, digital in general and mobile in particular. So um, I was also involved in the, you know, Google acquisition with AdMob and integration of AdMob into the Google platform and work on different um, full, full stack of uh, AdMob you know, um, mobile monetization solutions including uh, on the publisher side how to better monetize mobile applications and on the advertiser side including a lot of uh, enterprise customers on how to acquire valuable users and how to um, measure the quantified and user values over time. Um, and how to bring user back into their mobile consumptions and so on. Now um, we're um, starting to look into how to bridge mobile um, together with the desktop and solve a lot of uh, new challenging problems like uh, cross, uh, cross hit screen, um, user audience tracking and stuff like that. Um, um, and so I would like to share with you more how you know, we answer the Thank you, Kate. Yeah, the next one is uh, Dr. Wei Li from NetBase. Okay. Okay, so, yeah, my name is Wei Li. Uh, I'm actually a communication linguist uh, for, for, for the last seven years. So, of course, in LinkedIn, I, I put a data scientist because it's getting you know, a lot of attention for data science. I see <laughs> make, make myself more saleable. But anyway, the computational data is doing a lot of natural language processing work. Uh, now it's, uh, it's on big data for social media. So um, that's my background. And the company, uh, what, uh, what uh, uh, my company is doing now is a, it's a late stage startup in Silicon Valley doing social media in many languages, including English and Chinese. And uh, uh, the sources uh, for our processing in order to make the data, big data, into uh, values and, uh, and analytics which can serve the enterprise is uh, from social media. Uh, in English, it's actually dominated by Twitter and Facebook. 60% of Twitter, usually the case, 20% uh, of Facebook. Uh, all the the other south and south of the forums is only the main ten percent. Uh, okay, from this big data, of course now uh, for this audience, so I'm uh, giving some examples of Chinese social media, uh, how we process it uh, turn that into values. So you see, social media is different from the uh, uh, standard uh, language, natural language, like news, uh, right? Uh, it is uh, full of uh, uh, jargons, uh, misspellings, so uh, and all these emoticons, all these uh, kind of things, which are very uh, uh, difficult to really, uh, for the machine to pass. Uh, however, I've got 30 years of experience, so I must be good at it. So I make a decent system to present this type of thing. Uh, just give you some examples of how, uh, how Chinese uh, social media posts uh, uh, is processed uh, in order to produce all these fancy uh, visualizations of the analytics which actually serve the purpose uh, for enterprise to understand what the consumers uh, like your products or dislike your product and why they like it or dislike it. So you can see, uh, you can use the analytics which we have mined from the chat. Chinese social media or English social media, as we are doing uh, dozens of languages there, to, uh, to, do, to do things like uh, customer sentiments, right? To find the uh, likes and dislikes. To do the comparisons of the different brands uh, in the industry. Uh, actually, more examples of this uh, comparison of, uh, of brands, which is really, really uh, interesting because in the traditional way, you give surveys to your customers, you get feedback. What do you do? You only have the budget to do one brand uh, or two brands. You don't have the, uh, uh, the, the budget to do all the, uh, all the competitive brands in order to compare them. 
uh, in, the, in the same landscape, you have to understand like, where you stand. You just cannot afford to do that. You hardly don't have the time and money to do your own brand, not to say other brand, but with these automated solutions, you can do this in seconds. Okay, now all this uh, comparison uh, in details uh, for the example of a brand comparison, and you can also find all these uh, uh, themes. This is one example I did uh, to see how the fast food industry uh, brands, uh, 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 what is their public image in people's minds in Chinese social media? As you can see, Pizza Hut, Bishan Kuo, and yeah, it's very high there. Not really high. They, they, they're all in the corner of this line. So that it means the international brands of fast food actually are getting not as popular as it used to be, right? But anyway, among them, you can see Pizza Hut is on the top. However, Kentucky is the biggest about us because there are more people who are, who are talking about it. So uh, immediately, you can put all the different brands in one picture to see where they stand. This is the one example actually we do it on, uh, in real time when Obama debates with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, in, in the presidential debate October 16th last year. We put our system in real time, uh, monitoring Twitter data to see the sentiments up and down. Uh, when they talk about each topic, you'll see, for example, Obama actually went down in the sentiments because people uh, seem to dislike the frame. When they talk about the two things, one is the policy towards China. They think Obama is too weak. They all want the, the you know, their sentiment uh, of, 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 of China to be too strong for, for America. Anyway, and there's another uh, time when Obama uh, was uh, discussing the job market. Everybody disliked him because he didn't make the economy uh, as good as it should be. As you can see, it's real. It's real time, and we get these trends, and it makes sense. We can make sense of this. You, see, you might say, well, it's common sense. Uh, when, 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 when these points are, are, are being talked about, so Obama is uh, in a disadvantage, so uh, the sentiments are going down. So what do you find? You don't find normal, normal things. But look at this. If you find things which make sense in the common sense, when something suddenly show up which actually are against common sense, it's something which is like, really insightful. It's something which you can only get from big data. You are you cannot get it by yourself because it, you are overwhelmed by data. Okay, that's all for my introduction, and I'll talk more and share with you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. So the last one uh, is uh, 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 Piers uh, from my team. Good afternoon. I guess a company like IBM doesn't need an introduction for their own company. And uh, being in the enterprise space, we do a lot of things uh, with software and uh, services. Uh, this get me on, please. So uh, in terms of uh, uh, knowing about uh, IBM, how many of you know in the audience that uh, IBM is the world's second largest software company. Very good. How many of you know that IBM has the largest set of patents in the world? Very nice, very nice. And how many of you knew that IBM has the largest set of patents for social media? <laughs> and search. We have people in uh, the panel here, but again, I doesn't get to talk about that. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, big data. And here's an introduction about myself. I've been a management consultant all my life. Uh, in five years in the industry, multiple industries. And I'm basically uh, um, focused on strategic initiatives and I help co-found co our uh, business analytics and optimization center of competency within IBM as part of our services team. I've been involved with globalization efforts. I've created jobs in India, China, and Brazil, and other centers. Uh, again, component of globalization, but at the same time, component of uh, competency development. And uh, my latest thing is uh, on the big data analytics center of excellence that I'm leading worldwide right now. So, uh, with that introduction, hopefully this thing works. All right. So, it's no surprise that this uh, just go back. 
we are in a conference of uh, um, mobility, cloud, and big data. Um, so much so that the word big data is so much used today, it appears like a buzzword. But I want to make sure we all are on the same page because uh, we've had so many speakers tell us and in this conference talk about nobody touched on the definition of big data. So hopefully, this will demystify. To us, volume, variety, velocity are the standard parameters of big data, right? Everybody thinks huge amount of data is big data. Yes, but that's not it. That's what big data at rest. Huge variety of data, in addition to text and images and video, uh, all of that combined with traditional transactional data, that's, that's definitely a variety of data we are talking about. And that gets more prominent in today's world when we have the technologies available, the software and the hardware available to do it economically and competently and effectively. So that's why we get that very powerful. The other factor here is velocity. High speed moving data coming in and being able to analyze on the flow on uh, in flight. That's what uh, extreme data coming from call data records in uh, um, call centers, in telecom switches, and you're able to analyze that. This technology has also been used for counter measures, and uh, with the NSA leaks uh, recently, I'm sure you've heard how all of us are being smoothed on, but effectively it's being used for uh, predicting the shores. The final point I want to make here is uh, veracity, which is you can't really trust the data, big data, as it is, because uh, there is a lot of issues with data. Even in transactional systems, even in the traditional data warehouses, in the traditional environment, about 33% of the executives don't trust the data that they get in their reports from their own department. In fact, 50% of the time the data comes into an enterprise never gets touched again and never gets analyzed. So all of that is changing, and we from IBM see that leveraging all four of these characteristics um, effectively will, will make us uh, go forward. So in the era of big data, what you see is the tip of the iceberg. 80% uh, of the data is unprotected, untouched, and a uh, lot of uh, external data combined with the enterprise data, combined with the sensorial data that comes out of machines, all machines emit data, but we are not leveraging that. And there's big data, which of course comes from uh, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, all the social media sites. Got to analyze all that, combine all that, to be able to generate value. So I represent the services arm of IBM, which deals with uh, combining technology with business processes and generating value out of data, uh, help consumers as well as businesses see uh, better profit. All right, so we see big data as part of the overall IT landscape where you have a managed, you have the external and the internal data sources coming in. You've got to integrate that data. Data is a natural resource, right? But just like any natural resource, like oil, unless it is filtered, it has no value. And that's what we talk about integrating and in our data integration suite. And then finally, analyzing it. And analyzing it. It means deriving value from big data as well as from that data together. And above all, it, that entire thing needs to be governed and managed. And uh, hence, when you see how we treat data in its entirety throughout its life cycle, you've got to treat it together. And uh, so data governance uh, comes into prominence there. So this is our uh, big data platform, that uh, vision that we have. Um, you look at, at the center, you have a Hadoop system. We have a distribution of Hadoop based on Apache, um, and uh, on top of that, we've got uh, IBM research uh, tools and techniques uh, added onto it, and uh, we sell that as a package solution called Big Insights. Then, uh, from screen computing, or data coming in very fast, we've got the InfoSphere screens, and then we have the traditional data warehouse, the data warehouse clients, and uh, we have through acquisitions of number of acquisitions that um, portfolio. And then uh, recently, about the contextual search and uh, discovery engine that we bought from uh, acquisition of Jogismo. Combine all of that together in our 
platform and uh, combine it with accelerators that we built to help deliver these solutions to the market, um, along with uh, visualization discovery tools, along with applications which are industry-based. All of this forms our vision of uh, big data. And uh, uh, what we have seen in the market is the top five big data use cases. I mean, we've engaged with tens of thousands of customers around the world for the last five, six years. Uh, and specifically around the loop in the last uh, three years. Uh, but with, with the respect to screen computing, we've been there for the last 10 years. We helped uh, with develop a product which gets used by intelligence agencies within the US and elsewhere. So uh, the five big use cases that we see here with respect to exploration, to a bigger exploration to innovate in new products, uh, whether it is the 360 degree view of the customer, and this transcends enterprise as well as the consumer field, uh, enhanced 360 degree view of the customer. Uh, then there is uh, uh, an application where you need to find awareness of data for avoiding risk and for fraud detection. Huge losses in Medicare, huge losses in um, businesses, but if we had a proactive way of finding it ahead of time, that's what big data lets us do, and that's what we are doing for clients. Then there are zero latency operations, for example, in data centers. If each machine, each server, gives out so many signs that it is bearing out, their components are failing, but that few log doesn't get analyzed properly. So this is what we see as a, a use case where we have leveraged our software to do that. And uh, finally, exploiting instrument, uh, instrument analysis, of course, uh, again, leveraging sensor data. we we'll move on, please. So some more uh, explanation about the use cases. Uh, I'm not going to repeat it in the interest time. Let's keep moving, please. So we did a study. How is the market adopting big data? And we saw that uh, last year, October, we did a study. We have IBM Institute of Business Value as part our team and IBM Global Business Services chapter plan. About 73% uh, of the market is still exploring and educating, and only 6% have gone into production. And this was a survey done globally, the data coming from 96 different countries, about 100 executives responded, and this is what we found. So we then we delved down deeper into as to why is that and what we can do to improve. So if you could move on. So in the 2000 odd implementations that we've done with IBM and non-IT technologies around big data in the last three years, we have seen that there are challenges with the diverse and structure as well as unstructured and growing data. And whether it is production data sources, we've solved problems in the environmental field, we've uh, for traffic reduction in Singapore, Dublin, and a variety of cities around the world. Uh, whether it is for counterterrorism measures, whether it is for reducing crime, whether it is for tax fraud detection, or for improvement of the general life of people through uh, monitoring of sensor data that comes out of a patient and saving their lives. All of that is again fast moving sensor data, acquisition of big data, and there, in fact, I can make it knowledge that leverage. And then uh, all of that combined geospatial and social media and video and audio provide such an enriching experience, not only for the consumers, but that the consumer experience can be leveraged and monetized into what the enterprises can benefit from it. For example, um, cross-platform promotions, geolocation-wise, uh, Googling, all of that uh, is, is definitely being leveraged out of the retail industry today. You can move on. So just uh, finishing as what other uh, so this is my team around the world. Um, we have big data analytics resources around the world. Um, uh, India, China, and Brazil were the ones where I was focused on building the analytics team uh, for the last six years. And we've done that. If you can move on, please. For some reason. OK, so this is different divisions of IBM involved with analytics and big data. Um, we have research, hardware, software, all coming together to form uh, uh, our practice here. Please move on. So we have not only grown organically, we have been acquiring companies. So the, so if you can see, since 2005, we've spent about $16 million in acquisitions in this space and uh, bolstered our portfolio. And this helps us serve our clients better in the enterprise space. And uh, you can see there are um, so many, not only 
performing consultants, but there are ancillary uh, professionals available, and we also help develop the ecosystem through our uh, entrepreneurship programs, through our business partner programs, and we've partnered with more than 300 uh, people and companies in the big data staff itself, and we develop such partnerships partnerships uh, to deliver solutions to the market. One piece. So some examples, uh, if you can take one, uh, 30 seconds each. So Cisco definitely was uh, an example where we leveraged our big data and motion technologies for intelligent infrastructure management. Uh, move on, we quickly go through it. And for vehicle manufacturing processes, we use, uh, again, not only for IBM internal chip manufacturing, but for our clients as well, leverage big data technologies. Uh, another example in the ports and cargo, uh, UK, um, you know, container repositioning, being able to optimize the efforts of the communities. Again, counterterrorism measures where you are leveraging for the security of a building as well as for security of uh, government installations. Traffic congestion reduction, this is in uh, Sweden, but we have a similar project in uh, Singapore as well, a similar project in Dublin as well. All of that getting the data from uh, the cars that are moving in, the sensors that are on the road, and, and analyze that. And this sensor data from uh, detects floods sooner. So again, applying all these big data technologies to improve the life of normal citizens and to help governments improve their uh, governance programs. Move on, please. Uh, Swiss Railway. Keep on. Aerospace wind factor, again, uh, you know, we are able to save uh, the lives of so many people uh, if you can avoid crashes, right? But also, you can reduce the operational costs if you are able to predict when that particular engine will be down, when that aircraft will be down. So, uh, again, ice cool flow movement. I, I can go on and on, 10,000 examples I don't want to give. If we can just keep on, so we can move on. Uh, energy. Uh, renewable energy as well as uh, for smart grid. Um, again, developing all that. So just a minute here on how I think to deliver this value is from whether it's an analyst saying that you know, both Gartner and Forrester say I think this is number one in big data space, or whether our clients are saying unless uh, we have a developing uh, ecosystem of entrepreneurs, of employees, of stakeholders, in, and move this big data phenomenon together, uh, there's no value to it. But in the end, I'd like you all to leave with this message, think big, and hopefully we'll interact more. Thank you. So, uh, so I'm glad that at the very beginning when I arranged for this kind of discussion, I want them to introduce himself because that will make the later part of the discussion so much easier because, as you can tell, that all these uh, slides already lay a very good foundation on the definition of the big data and also, you know, like uh, what are the important uh, components of it. Now, so so let's get into um, the big data area. We know it's, it's huge. There are many, many aspects of it, and there are many, many areas that can have innovations. And I'm sure, you know, for all of you who are sitting here, uh, one one main purpose is to understand it more. The other one is to try to understand, you know, what are the challenges and what area that we can use innovation, right? So I'll, I'll focus on a few major building blocks of the big data because we know that um, you know, like yeah, no matter how smart the system is, you are just as good as what you can get in the data. So data collection is a big area that can use a lot of innovation. And then also, you know, we're getting into the data analysis. There's a lot of techniques and a lot of um, a lot of innovation in that area. And then the data storage management and then the safety, security and privacy, and then at the very end of it is the representation, right? Each one of them are huge, huge areas and that, that can we can talk forever in each one. But let me just focus on the very first one right now, and which is the data collection. Because we know that if you're not, if you're not able to get the data, you're not able to do the rest of the work, right? And, and a lot of you are gonna say, look, we have no lack of data we got a lot of data coming in. But that is also a challenge too. What what are the important ones that you're looking for? How do you pull them? And there's a lot of um, a lot of the, uh, the innovation that we can, we can discuss here. So I'd like to this, uh, direct a question to Dr. Lee.
because he's, um, he was talking about the unstructural data, right? Because we know in the data area that there's, um, you know, besides our form of the data, there are two big areas, the structural data and the unstructural data. So I'd like to have Dr. Lee to talk, you know, talk a little bit more about the technique and the challenge in the area that he's uh, very uh, specialized in. And then, um, and then we'll, 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 we'll talk about the, the comparison between the two, the structural data versus the stru uh, unstructural data. So Dr. Lee, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, data has a structure, structured data size and an unstructured data. As such, it usually refers to the natural language test, like uh, uh, the posts that people, uh, people put in, in social media, like Facebook, and Twitter, and Weibo, and Weixin, and those places. Uh, OK, uh, the structured data side, uh, I'm not an expert, but I just want to talk comparison. The structured data side uh, actually has generated uh, some uh, successful stories for a long time, for quite some time in data mining uh, world. So you can see if you go to Amazon to buy certain things, right? They will make a recommendation to you, saying that why, why don't you buy this? Uh, other friend who buy the same thing, actually buy this. And it, it actually makes sense because they use their big data in a structured way, uh, and then uh, try to make the, uh, the recommendations. Uh, then the other side is really something which is a gold mine, which is hidden there, not yet uh, explored as much, which is just uh, the unstructured data. It includes all the social media things, which is explosive in the last uh, three or four years, and also includes a lot of uh, you know review data, uh, the customer uh, feedback. You know, every big business has a lot of uh, customer review data and call center data and those things, which are in. English, Chinese, or in those national languages. Largely, as, uh, as you just said, it's uh, largely evolved. It's not even touched. Uh, there's no, uh, no, uh, no, there's, there's not until now, um, uh, there's, uh, there's no technology which is processing. Anyway, we are just uh, doing that type of thing, and uh, we find that well, it's an extraordinary opportunity for national language processing to meet big data. It's not just a bug which everyone is talking about. It's a real thing because uh, the one point I want to make is that uh, the natural language processing is, uh, is, uh, is by nature even of the technology. Just because the natural language is so complex, right? You can imagine how, how, how many of different ways people will speak in natural language. And then the technology which can pass this language into, into semantics actually is imperfect by nature. And it will remain imperfect for a long time to go. Uh, before big data uh, comes uh, uh, in place, the input technology is a bottleneck, right? If you don't really process the data uh, properly, how can people trust your uh, parting results, your semantics? However, when big data comes into place, the sheer redundancy in the big data actually compensates for the imperfectness of the, of the technology. Uh, in terms of the metrics like precision and recall, which is everybody using, right? In, uh, in, 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 in the system. And then you find that, uh, of course, redundancy compensates for recall. If you don't cover that much, doesn't matter because you have redundancy, you have big data. As far as you scale up your system, you will get that in, inside, so on data. So, uh, and precision also uh, is, help, is helped by big data because of using any sampling technique, you'll be able to find whatever surfaces are top are the things which are more reliable than things which are. Uh, which are done at the bottom. So even for precision, what you get from big data is also much better than the engine itself, right? It's just a sentence by sentence, post by post. Well, um, so Dr. Lee, I, I'd like to expand on that a little more. So um, we talk about, you know, you say it, it's a constant evolving thing of uh, using the natural language to, to um, pause the data, right? So, and also the semantics. So how do you know at what time that you should really normalize some of the words and at what time that you should not? Because you, in one of those slides that you have mentioned that, you know, some of the words, they are new ones, right? Because the kids and nowadays using the web and using the, you know, the cell phone, they actually introduce a lot of the new words. And we, some of them we don't even understand. Now, how do you know at certain time that that is important and, and then you should normalize? 
Yeah, actually, the, especially in social media, right? When you compare with the traditional way and the news uh, and uh, in the written, uh, written, written English or Chinese, uh, people are interrupted by the teachers how to really write properly. And you, see, you go to social media, you find all kinds of things. People are in the rush, they, they post messages from the mobile phones, they don't have time, they just rush out or whatever. So there's a lot of ungrammatical inputs, uh, jargons, uh, emoticons, all those different things are happening there. So there's uh, really a big issue of normalization. So before you can really process it by a regular engine, right, in order to make sense of it, you need to normalize the things. Normalization actually is a uh, it's a, it's a really, I mean, it, it's a, it's a, it's a labor thing. You, you work more on this, uh, you will get more. But uh, keep in mind, for things which are not ambiguous by nature, there's not a big issue. All you need is to have either automated way or uh, manual way of collecting all these uh, uh, irregular ways of expressions and try to map them into regular ways from some, some big lessons. Uh, that's only a labor thing. But there are a lot of cases in the natural languages, those things are, an, uh, are ambiguous, so that we have to use uh, uh, some type of uh, uh, context in order to really disambiguate and the map to revise to do it. So there are so different techniques, like uh, people use uh, both machine learning uh, uh, and also use the traditional ways of uh, grammar approach, rule based system, in order to really handle it. Right, right. So, okay. So that's great. Talking about, because um, my experience in the past is that well, data normalization could take a lot of efforts. And um, sometimes you, you do have to use human and not just machine to do it. So do you, in, in your experience, when you build a vocabulary, do you need to sometimes even have, as human to that define it? And that is a very important new word that just been invented and also being used a lot. Actually, we use both because, uh, for example, I use the interns in order to help with some kind of manual collection of the uh, uh, huge vocabulary of the new things, the internet jargons, which they are more familiar than, than I am. I don't understand all the things, but they, they, they really, right, they, are, they are by nature on, online all the time. Uh, on the other hand, we do have automated ways of finding things which are just uh, uh, certainly not uh, Those things which are just uh, occurring by the, by the frequency. Uh, are the things which we really want to capture. If our current system does not pass them, and then they are so frequent, and then we get further uh, in a certain automatic way, and then try to, uh, to apply different techniques in order to incorporate that in our system. Here's one answer. Yeah, just, I, I'm not sure how many in the audience are uh, familiar, as familiar with uh, natural language processing as uh, Dr. Lee. So how, just, just try to get a sense of natural language processing experts in the audience. Okay, one, two. So for the benefit of 98% uh, of the audience, um, what does it mean when I say, last night I shot an elephant in my pajamas? Does it mean the elephant was in my pajamas? Or did I shoot the elephant with a gun? Or did I take a picture of the elephant? Right? So, so that's the difficulty with natural language processing. So, so that now we are on the same page. And what does it do? The technology is now available. The machine learning technologies give us certain things. And that's what uh, the data going on just now. But then there are human intervention techniques that have been invented. Uh, there are platforms available. For example, one platform is CrowdFlower, which lets you uh, engage with the rest of the world people. Uh, there's another example, um, Amazon Turk, right? Anyone familiar with that? So people use that to augment whatever knowledge that they're getting through machine learning, machines are learning, but use human inputs to filter that and reduce the error component. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Pirish. Uh, see, we're all learning something new, right? That's what this panel is all about. Now, I, I want to ask Ping. Ping works in Google. Ping, do you see where you, you know, you're currently working on? Is more of a structural data or is more of an unstructured data? So, so in the context of uh, computational advertising, I mean, there's uh, there's a mix of both, right? Like many other areas, I mean, you know, we have tons of structured data where you know it's a user user generated requests um, from different type of media that you know we process in, in the system. Like we also uh, we also 
you know, run advertisement for e-commerce website where they have tons of uh, product fee. You know, the product fee by definition is uh, structured data. Um, on the other hand, we also have tons of unstructured data. I mean, um, you know, in order to monetize different kind of media, we have to understand the nature of different kind of media. And um, you know, for for example, a web page, um, you know, AdSense runs on. Uh, currently, we receive like 40 billion ad requests a day um, in uh, you know our ad system, and and a lot of them are from you know unstructured data web pages. And you know the way we process them is you know we just grab the web page and to analyze what the web page is talking about, and we use probabilistic language model to understand you know the what uh, taxonomy that each um, each web page falls into, and. And then you know we try to that that way we, we better understand you know, the web page. Um, on the other hand, like for example, the new media uh, in our case, the mobile applications. We also want to understand you know the word mobile application uh, is talking about. You know, they, you know there's um, but by definition, you know, mobile application doesn't have you know that contextual information that we often see in the web in the worldwide web context. So you know, we try to understand that by looking at you know the reviews and you know the descriptions in the in the app store. You know that's the way how we put in the ads in them. Um, yeah, actually, I would I would like to you know ask the audience a question. I mean, um, you know, I was listening to all these intros, and sorry if I hijacked the conversation. So when we talk about big data, I mean, all this technology has been has been around for decades. Like you know, structured data, you know, relational databases, you know, data mining, distributed databases. Why now, you know, we start to consider about you know big data, and why you know the big data becomes a becomes a you know a, a hot buzzword. Um, so so I you know I was always confused um, by this because you know if you look at the database and papers in the, uh, 30 years ago in IBM. You know, research and you know, like, you know relational R in the database, you know, how, how, how you, you know, and if you look at today, you know, there's not so much in terms of fundamental technology that has been developed. But you know, I think, and from my per personal view, I, I just have like uh, two two points. Um, mainly, what I feel is, you know, basically, internet is entering each more and more into every aspect of our human life, and in the past, like two two decades. And as a result, and you know, it, as you can see, in the past one decade, every in, every citizen, as if they are connected to the internet, they will be able to become an author. They will be able to voice their opinions, right? So I think they will generate tons of data. So you know, they can overthrow government. They can uh, they can they can do a lot of crazy things. And another thing is is mobile, right? So I think in the past two uh, two years. What I want, you know, we generate, humankind generate collectively more data than we have ever generated in the front of the beginning of the time. So I think mobile, basically, we carry the smartphones, which is capable, more capable than many supercomputers like 20 years ago. But, and, you know, we carry them around, you know, on every corner of human society, and they're generating data. So, so I think, um, yeah, I would like to, you know, you know maybe some of uh, other panelists to share on, you know, why. You know, big data certainly becomes uh, you know what's the you know new technology that's really under under the line. Yeah, I think it was Michelle. Yeah, actually, big data was not just a uh, it's not just available today, right? So uh, when Google Google becomes Google because of the big data, because there was no big data, why we need a search engine, right? So big data was there in in terms of the volume. Uh, of course, the volume is keep, keeps growing up, but uh, it, it doesn't really change its nature, except for one thing. Big data becomes a buzzword. It goes hand in hand with social media. Before social media stage, big data was there. But when you do a Google search, what do you get? You get all the collections of this data from everywhere you, know, you can imagine about a particular topic. But you don't have any association of this data with the background, with the user profile. But social media makes it different. Because when social media comes in life, you find that data is innately associated with individuals, with consumers. It makes all the difference because now the data can be diced and sliced in different perspectives, different demographics, well, put into timelines, put into the uh, geographies, and then you can make so much sense of it. 
and then it will really turns uh, turns into values for businesses as well as for consumers. Okay. So see, and as I can tell you at the very beginning, each one small area is a huge area. We're only touching the data collection area, and today it's already told me we only have five more minutes. But anyway, I want to touch the second one, and I actually have five areas I think that would be great for future conferences. But let me touch the second one first, which is the data analytics, right? And because you get the data, and if you're not intelligent, it's not going to make any sense out of it. And there's a huge amount of innovation in this area, right? So I'd like to ask first, Pierce, and then ask David, because both are working on a lot of these um, enterprise applications and solutions. And I'd like to then talk a little bit about putting things in context, because that's an extremely important. If you don't put things in context, Data is just garbage. Garbage in, garbage out. We don't extract any value out of it, right? So, Pierce, can you share a little bit about your experience on you know some of those applications that you uh, you worked on? For example, like last night when we were chatting, we talked about you know the Brazilian company, uh, the Brazilian government, and um, you know look up to the idea that they want to find solutions for their you know. Right. Their so I, I can cite a number of examples from our smart design which then shows smart cities and whatnot. And, uh, while uh, we have examples of big data solving um, Medicare uh, health, healthcare challenges, we've got uh, examples of a client coming to us and saying, hey, can you improve the profitability of an industry or a particular problem within, within my department? Uh, can you improve the uh, uh, workforce productivity in my XYZ department? Move it on to when a country heads of uh, government comes and say, hey, can you help me in my security problem? Can you help me in improving my GDP and economy? Now, that's something which is so abstract. It's not a technical problem anymore. It's a combination of out-of-the-box thinking, creative thinking, and putting all your smarts together. So what we do, we put our domain experts together, industry experts, along with our technology specialists and I participated in the innovation discovery workshop last week with that heads of state saying, okay, what can we do and how data can be an enabler? So how can we make governments data driven? We have helped companies become data driven and leverage every data point available. Context is important, important we talk about it. In terms of uh, how a particular uh, web link gets promoted on a website uh, or how uh, Netflix can uh, tell you what other movies you would like to watch. That's all based on the context of the browsing that you may have done. So those are consumer examples, but in enterprises, there's tons and tons of examples that uh, big data can be used. In the interest of time, I'll let uh, David now chime in. Yeah. <clears throat> I think the reason why the enterprise, I mean, we have been talking about big data for so many decades, right? a few decades, but we never really put into action until the consumer internet takes off. Because the consumer internet, we are talking about a billion people or a couple hundred million people. And that's why you need to really harness the data if you accumulate it, right? Whether from web or from mobile. So for me, I study uh, pattern recognition uh, for back to school. Right? Actually, after I finished the degree, uh, it's not easy to find a commercial job, actually. Right? At that time, and that was 1994. So um, I joined Oracle. It's my first job after school. So that's I'm coming from a relational uh, database background. Like, I mean, we work with our clients. Normally, their data is very structured data. The amount of data, and that time we thought it's very huge. Like, it's a big data at that time. But looking back, it's a small data, very small uh, data. And then uh, talking about what is the future of uh, analytics, I think. I uh, highly recommend everyone to watch the uh, movie. Many of you already watched Iron Man 3, right? So Iron Man 2, Iron Man 3 tried to find the root cause of the explosion. Look, he went to his home, right? and he generated all kinds of holistic images, visualizations, and then there's human and machine interactions to find out what's the root of the explosion. I think that's pretty much the holy grail of the, of the, uh, the, the analytics, because I think Machine cannot figure out everything, and not not everything could be predicted. If everything could be predicted, then I think we'll probably the movie 
minority to be talked into that you can predict this person after 30 years, he's going to commit a crime, then you can arrest this person today <laughs> to be used the crime. So I think uh, technology definitely would be very helpful. I think this is a complete tremendous value, but it's still a prediction. And then for our company, we see this is a big uh, uh, paradigm shift because uh, from mainframe to client server, and now we see a totally new techno stack. Um, the first techno stack is a cloud fabric, like right? cloud fabric is a new power, the virtual power. The second one actually is here to me, uh, is, is sitting together. One is the data fabric, the next one is the application fabric. App application fabric need to be mobile first, need to be able to interconnect with the internal web services, external web services. We are not going to adjust this problem. For the data fabric, it's getting more and more complex. Previously, many banks were dealing with, they just need to install an Oracle D2 plus Teradata. That's all, most of the, their problems are CPC and data and data. Many Oracle X data machines, Teradata machines, crunch all those data uh, for 400 million uh, consumers, let's say. Uh, we bring uh, some part of it. But now today, like, the banks, actually, they deal with uh, a lot of um, valuable data on the table, and they are not able to uh, drive value from it. But today we put with the technology from consumer internet, Hadoop, or machine learning, R language, etc. Now it makes a lot of sense. You can, previously for call center, we are one of the largest banking call center software provider in China. Many of banks are our customers. Previously, it's a pure call center. We're trying to minimize the call duration for each sales agent, right? Each phone call with your customers. But today we try to harness the value from the conversations, and you, you can translate, you can do voice to text translation, you can try to do sentimental analysis, right? all kinds of things you can derive from there. And similarly for e-banking, previously we only have a very simple e-banking software for many banks, but today we can try to monitor customer behavior just like our internet companies. And those data could be archived, could be, could be analyzed. So, I mean, first archive to the Hadoop, you can do map reduce, you can run all kinds of machine learning algorithms, and then those inside, the from unstructured to structured, you put into the edge page, right? And then your recommendation engine could, could do all kinds of, uh, it read all kinds of data from there. So that's, I mean, it's very complex. The, the world has become so complex, the data fabric, and it's still evolving, we're still learning from it. So I think it's a very exciting uh, age, I think um, everyone can see tons of things from there. There's a lot of good questions to be asked and to be answered. So um, looks like we're running out of time. Um, I would, if, if I got my um, my will, I would love to continue on the next three topics. Those are the big ones. So maybe maybe in the future that would be good for the other other conferences and other seminars. Uh, so, but I'd like to ask one last one I, before Janice come up here. I know you probably have that in your mind. Say, look, I listen to you all. It looks like these are all big problems. And like, okay, I've been solving the Brazilian government's problem. And then in the Lens Info's case, solving the ICBC's problem. And they're very big. And when we put the business case together, and we normally, in that case, do it in the one-off way, very specific to their need, is a solution. But there could be a lot of people thinking like, well, if I'm a small company, I'm not, I'm not getting a one-off solution. Is there any tool out there that can allow me to have the very generic way of putting the business logic into the set data so I can crank something out of it? So I'd like to ask that question to Ping, because Ping is doing the Google Ads that serve a lot of people who do advertisement. And I'd like to ask Ping, say, when you provide a tool to all these Average small company that do advertisement, do you allow them to specify their intelligence into the system to extract uh, information out of it? Uh, yeah, so, so I think one example I can give is, uh, you, know, you know, a very important technology in the, in the advertising field is called retargeting. So basically, I mean, you can, you can, you know, from your data collected from your own property, like website, you know what who the user are and you know how valuable they are and they're depending on yourself. Like for for example, you know, some you know can, customer they can put into a shoot into their you know, shopping cart but they never check out. You know, so I think then you want to run advertise 
months to track down these users and to, to remind them that you know you come back to our site and you know we can run an offer, we can run a coupon, you know we can give a discount on their shoes and you know or similar products. So for that particular uh, for that particular technology, the underlying the underlying you know um, technologies, you know we can allow advertisers in you know first of all they need to set up their website with our analytical tools so that you know they'll be able to track the user. Uh, user behavior on their site, and then they can annotate you know, in a generic way, you know how the user in the key value pairs, and then they can get, get into our system and and tell us to define a set of rules to say you know I want to create a user list that consists of the customers who visited this website web page of this portion of my website, or you know hasn't visited hasn't come back to my site for in the past thirty days, but collectively spend like two hundred dollars in the in the a year before that. So I think these rules are very generic. And our system will be able to crank and connect the, these rules with all the user data that we'll collect and then you know automatically generate uh, the user list, you know. And these potential is a high value user, these are the number of turning users that you want to reach out and, and so on. And then if they can connect the user list with their um, with their uh, CRM, and then they can reach out to the user not only not only on the Google properties, but also you know through you know prints, uh, you know sending mails to their uh, phones and so on. So I think um, this is like one example I will, I will give you that you know is uh, you know use big data and also kind of provide a generic way that you know advertising a small business that can um, use use our service. Thank you so much. I learned a lot too. I really enjoyed the conversation. And um, and also thank you all for the audience to stay up uh, to this late on Saturday afternoon. And if you have more questions, please feel free to ask um, all these panelists um, offline and uh, when we all get off the podium. Thank you very much. <laughs>